Welcome everybody, I'm Tom Colohue and you're on my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about the swamp fight at the WWE Extreme Rules pay-per-view. We're going to break it down and go in-depth with pros, cons and perspectives for the most talked about match of the show that didn't involve an eye being pulled out, some false refereeing, or in fact a championship win without any match at all. On the panel today are three of my most esteemed colleagues. In the green corner we have Rick Uchino of ESPN 1530 Radio. In the pink corner we have Stephanie Chase of Digital Spy. Finally, in the Mauve and Paisley corner, we have Corey Guns of Sports Keeda's Drop Kick Discussions podcast. Links to their profiles will be listed below. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking Swamp Fight today. We have a range of opinions, so we're going to run through a range of topics. I'm starting with you, Rick. A lot of work went into the stage design for the swamp, including some creepy trees, a lot of water, and a comfy chair for Braun to sit on. Did you feel a setting lived up to your expectations? For the most part, yes. I, I thought the mood of the Swamp Fight was exactly what it needed to be. Um, some lighting issues. Definitely saw the, uh, I don't know if anybody else caught the, the boom mic uh, shadows in the lighting, uh, especially on the um, warning sign that was uh, early on in the match. So there were a few, a few mistakes there. But overall, I thought, this, I thought the setting was fine. I thought the setup was fine. Uh, camera cuts were a, a little too much for my taste, but I didn't think they were, they were awful by any stretch of the imagi imagination. Not enough alligators. Uh, I was definitely expecting uh, s some alligators, especially after Braun went out of his way to say that he was going to let the alligators have Bray Wyatt, and we had no alligators. But, uh, yeah, no, other than that, uh, I'm, I, was, I was fine. They did show a lot of alligators. Now, excited to see more of those. I do like that you mentioned all the cuts and the changes because, speaking personally, I got quite dizzy with the amount of zoom in, zoom out that we got. Steph, what was your opinion of the setting? Um, I thought the setting was perfectly adequate. It uh, did feel like a swamp. Uh, it was nice and eerie. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I don't have much to say about the, sweaty, the setting. I thought it was just adequate and it, it did the job. Corey, what was your opinion of the actual swamp in the swamp fight? I agree with everybody else. I thought it was, you know, nicely done. I thought the production values were, were nice. It felt like they were in a swamp. Uh, which I think was basically the tone they were going for. So I agree with the jump cuts. You know, sometimes the lighting seemed like it was a little bit dark uh, for my taste. And like I said, a lot of the different cuts and, and video edits um, kind of made me a little bit dizzy at times. But I thought overall, you know, the setting itself, uh, it, it looked like a swamp. It looked like a place that Bray Wyatt would call home. So I thought they did a good job there. One criticism we have seen of the Firefly Funhouse was a lack of action in it. And this was, of course, the previous attempt at a cinematic match from Bray Wyatt. Now, in this particular match, we had some faceless minions who we'll probably never see mentioned again. We also had a guy being set on fire. We saw choke slams onto a dilapidated boat, and we even saw some attempted drowning. Steph, I want to start with you here. Was this an improvement action-wise to what we saw at WrestleMania? Uh, yeah, it was certainly an improvement action-wise in the Firefly Funhouse, because it did actually have some action. But as far as the action they presented, the guy getting set on fire stands out because that was one of the most random, unnecessary, weird things. And I don't know who that guy was. i am taken it he was a stuntman, but he gave one of the worst, like most comical performances of getting set on fire that I have ever seen. And like that has made me laugh out loud every time I've uh, rewatched it. Uh, as far as the choke slam on a dilapidated boat and attempt at drowning, I, that that all just came off as completely ridiculous to me. I would I would much rather have seen them have have some action in the actual wrestling ring rather than a swamp. I can't help but agree when it comes to the whole setting on fire business. There was so Braun was in the actual house and then he was around a fire and then there were people attacking him ninja warrior style. It all seemed unfortunately for any sort of wrestling quite staged in my opinion. So I definitely agree on that. Corey, what was your take on the action that we saw? Yeah, my biggest thing was I didn't think there was enough action between Bray and Braun themselves. I mean, everything was Braun fighting the, you know, the random people, you know, setting the guy on fire. You know, they had the big hostage scene between him and Wyatt. But, you know, this was still, I get that this was more of a storyline progression type of deal. And it was a cinematic thing. But, you know, I still feel like when I see Swamp Fight, Bray Wyatt versus Braun Strowman on a pay-per-view, I want to see those two guys fighting each other. And I think that was the biggest thing that we were lacking action-wise was 
Wyatt and Stroman really didn't get a lot of interaction uh, between each other. So I did think it was an improvement over the Funhouse match. I didn't think it was as good action-wise as the Boneyard match between Undertaker and AJ Styles. It's hard not to be an improvement over the action of the Firefly Funhouse because we really didn't see hardly anything. So even if it was just a few extra moves, it, it would have been an improvement. But I, I think the the lack of action between Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman, I think was actually kind of the point of this match. I think it was supposed to leave you wanting more because we're going to get these two again at SummerSlam. It was very evident by the end of that match that it's Braun Strowman versus The Fiend at SummerSlam, probably for the Universal Championship. So they wanted to leave you guys wanting more action. And I've always kind of thought of Bray Wyatt as kind of this schizophrenic sorcerer character, kind of like a, kind of like a, a Shang Tsung type person. From uh, That's a Mortal Kombat reference for uh, anybody who doesn't know. Um, that he can kind of just call upon these these lost soul minion type things. And that's what we saw with the guys who was there. He was sending those guys after Braun Strowman because, look, Bray Wyatt didn't want to fight Braun Strowman. He wanted to befriend Braun Strowman. And that, I believe, was, was part of why there was a, a, lack of, a lack of action between these two because it was never about beating Braun Strowman in this match for Bray Wyatt. It was about befriending him. And when he failed at the end, that's when the fiend showed up, and that's when the Eater of Worlds was dragged back down into whatever hell he, he's been hiding in the last few years. Um, I feel, I understand what you're saying about how they were trying to make us want more between Braun and Bray, but something like this just absolutely makes me want to see no more Bray at all. Um, I would much rather if this was like an actual swamp fight that they had had a fight like on the banks of a swamp that went into a swamp. It would have been pretty silly, but I could have accepted it as much. I'm just completely sick of seeing these uh, Bray uh, weird psychological storylines play out where we see two Braun Strowmans, we see an Alexa Bliss. To me, this is just their way of not actually telling a proper storyline through traditional wrestling means and dragging us into all this stuff instead. I think Bray's character is just at the point now of just being something that's so separate from everything else in, in WWE that is just a total detriment to the product overall. Like this guy's just being given way too much creative license for, for no reason. Yeah, and I think to both Rick and Stephanie's points, you know, to Rick's point about wanting to see more between Bray and Strowman, I get that, but that was really the whole problem I had with the Extreme Rules show as a whole, is it felt like everything that we saw in the pay-per-view was a lead-in or a hook to Monday Night Raw or SmackDown or maybe even to get us to SummerSlam. And I felt like on a pay-per-view, you can still have feuds extended, but there still should be some sort of payoff or climax to that night's matches. And so I did think that was a little bit of a cop-out for them to act like, well, we're not going to give you a whole lot at the Swamp Fight because we want you to watch Fiend versus Strowman at SummerSlam. And to Stephanie's point about the storyline progression, just like what Rick was saying about, you know, well, here's why they did this or here that's, here's why they did that. And all that is fine. But I think that in wrestling and especially for the wrestling audience, you've got to flesh those things out a little bit more, make them a little bit more obvious. Um, it shouldn't be up to the viewer to have to fill in the blanks with their own fan theories about why things are happening the way that they're happening. Um, I'm very entertained by Bray Wyatt, and I think that he is very creative. Um, and I like that he's getting some license with his characters. But I do think there comes a time where when you're putting storylines together and you're putting matches together, there's got to be some sort of structure and some sort of plan. You have to make that obvious to the audience so that they can follow along what's happening instead of having to kind of fill in the holes and kind of like a you know a movie where there's plot holes and it's kind of just left up to your imagination to fill something in that makes sense yeah and look just just real quick i i understand that these these kind of matches aren't for everybody and and, and i'm fine with that like steph if you just wanted to see these two big guys beat the hell out of each other that's fine i i, I completely get that i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fault the wwe for trying to do something different though um i will say to your point Corey, yeah it it does need to be 
a little bit more obvious about what's going on because with these Bray Wyatt cinematic matches, if you don't know your history of WWE, of sometimes WCW, of past storylines, of Braun Strowman, of Bray Wyatt, you're not going to know what's going on. And even if you do know all of that, you have to be paying attention the whole time because if you blink, you're going to be lost. So to your point, yes, I can get where you're saying with that. And I'm perfectly fine with people saying that these kind of matches aren't for them. That's not going to stop me from enjoying it any, any, that, much, that much less or that much more, whatever I meant to say there. Uh, I also think that Braun himself as a character, despite having history with Bray, was too weak a character to warrant this type of match in the first place. Uh, even though I wasn't a fan of the Firefly Funhouse, you could get so much out of John Cena and you could actually get more out of John and Bray just based on their previous feud. This Strowman thing, um, him being in that position, I... I don't think he was worthy of the position at all. I, even though him and Bray have the history of him being in the Wyatt family, I don't think that's even something that was properly in the fans' minds. Um, so I think if you're going to do one of these big production matches, something like Undertaker and AJ was perfect for it just based on the strength of the Undertaker character alone. But certainly I don't think Braun Strowman is someone that should be in this position. And I definitely don't think he has the charisma or even personality to carry it off. There were some rumors of Eric Rowan potentially returning for this match based on some of the pitches that were shown in the build to the match. In the end, that wasn't the case. As cameos go, and I want to start with you, Corey, on this one. What was your reaction to the use of Alexa Bliss in the match? I really liked it. Um, I thought it was clever storytelling to kind of, you know, make sister abigail and use that thread tie in between you know with the wyatt family and bray wyatt again i do think like i mentioned before that it it would take a little bit of creative license on the fans part to kind of make sense of why alexa bliss was there because i think to the casual fan their first reaction would be oh are they telling me that alexa bliss has been sister abigail all along when really people that have kind of been following the storyline you know, would be able to kind of remember and tell, oh, well, you know, Braun Strowman, he was in the Wyatt family and him and uh, Alexa Bliss were a team in that mixed match tournament they, they had on Facebook and they kind of teased a little bit of romantic chemistry between the two during all that. And that Sister Abigail may be just the kind of the, the spiritual being that maybe would lead Braun Strowman be, you know, to, to do certain things or to act a certain way because it's someone that he has a relationship with or you know, however you want to kind of connect those dots. And again, a lot of that is left up to the viewer. But for me personally, because I do know a little bit of that history, I did think that it was kind of a clever way to to put her in there. Um, I, I understood where they were going and, and kind of what they were trying to accomplish with that. Again, I'm not sure how uh, successful they were with that with the casual viewer. But for me personally, I thought it was kind of cool to see her uh, involved in, in some way, or at least her, I guess, her spirit or her essence being involved in the match. Yeah, I, I don't think it came over with the casual fan at all, just judging by the reaction that was out on, on Twitter, because to your point, Corey, everybody was like, wait a minute, hold on. So is Alexa's sister Abigail now? And then they started jumping to 15 different conclusions from there, uh, which is why I said earlier, yeah, you kind of have to know your history. And, and Corey, you, you pretty much wrapped up my exact feelings on this. I, I loved it. I thought it was a brilliant callback um, because even if you didn't pay attention to the mixed match challenge that was on Facebook, they did have, you know, a few on-screen moments. I remember one specifically where, you know, Braun Strowman is standing out on the side of the ring and Alexa Bliss gets knocked off of the apron and he catches her and then they look like they're going to go in for a kiss for like half a second and they, they, they pulled back. And so there was always that kind of romantic tension between these two when they've been on. So I thought that was a, a brilliant way for, for Bray to try to manipulate Braun to get him to come over to his side like, oh, hey here's Alexa Bliss. Here's this woman that, you, that you've always wanted, that you're pining after. So you come with me and she's yours. I, I thought that was a, a brilliant little callback. But yeah, the casual fans got lost on that one. Um, I agree with both uh, Rick and Corey that it definitely lost the casual fans. It was cool in a way, but at the same time, since I 
don't kind of like the whole premise that we're going with with um, what Bray's creating in, in other wrestlers' heads at the minute. Um, it was a bit of a total like jump the shark moment for me. Um, but I think the only way they could rectify it for me is if we get some footage up from the uh, forgotten hacker on SmackDown that shows like Bray maybe paying Alexa to make a little video that he can project in order to um, get the advantage on Braun and distract him. If they do something like that, then I'll totally forgive them everything. Well, that would definitely be a turn up for the books, I tell you that. And that's an interesting way to at least make the SmackDown hacker storyline relevant again, because we haven't seen it for a while and Mustafa Ali, of course, not on SmackDown anymore. I did want to ask particularly you, Steph, I'll start with you, but still ask everyone. As our resident AW expert, how much influence do you feel Matt Hardy had on this match type, considering the work he did in Impact, then with Bray Wyatt, and now in AEW? Yeah, I think without without Matt Hardy, we wouldn't be getting all of this. Um, I think what happened is Matt Hardy did something very good originally that got a lot of buzz, that was very creative, that was very out of the box, and now WWE have ran it into the ground really <laughs> i think yeah we can all bring this back to matt hardy initially um but i think that really the way i felt about matt originally is that he was doing something very cool and different and psychological the idea of him having kind of a breakdown with um his personality and his character change and i think it's now been turned into something completely different that's almost like a parody of how it started even though I guess to some people what Matt Hardy was doing was a bit of a parody anyway. Yeah I think that you know you can't understate Matt Hardy being kind of the father of all this cinematic universe stuff on WWE at least being able to push the idea to the forefront enough that the WWE tried it um, and now they're being a little bit more open to the idea of it uh, but to me I think that these definitely more so have the fingerprints to me of Bruce Pritchard on them. Uh, when you look at these cinematic matches, when you look at the swamp fight itself, like I said, I thought it was more of a storyline progression type segment, it, it more so than a match trying to tell a story. And if you look at the history of Bruce Pritchard, you know, he's the guy that created, you know, the Undertaker Kane storyline, uh, you know, doing a bunch of the Undertaker uh, vignettes, even going back to, you know, I remember the Jake the Snake Ultimate Warrior vignettes that were on primetime wrestling back in the day with, uh, you know, with King Cobras jumping out of boxes and all this crazy stuff. So to me, I really see him taking over the creative team. I think that he's really had a big influence on using these matches to try to tell stories. And I think it's somewhat telling that in addition to, you know, Bray Wyatt, the other guy that really has had a very successful cinematic match has been The Undertaker, who is one of Bruce Pritchard's best friends in the business. Yeah, I'm not sure how much uh, influence Bruce Pritchard has on uh, the the Bray Wyatt stuff. I, from everything that that I've read and I'm that I've understood, and I, I could be completely wrong on this because I'm I'm not an insider. I'm just going based off of what I've read. Is that a lot of this is 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 Bray Wyatt's brainchild basically that he had a lot of full creative control and I think he really saw that uh, in the swamp fight uh, especially uh, but going back to the original question yeah I, I agree with you too there's absolutely no question that uh, that, that Matt Hardy deserves a lot of the credit uh, and a lot of the influence on this even even just you know as much as the little dilapidated boat but I mean you know you, you bring in uh, WWE brings in a guy like Jeremy Borish who worked uh, on the uh, ultimate deletion match and I'm, I know he had a hand in the boneyard match as well I'd be stunned if he didn't have a hand in, in this one as well and and Matt Hardy you know he he worked closely with Bray Wyatt we know they the 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 leader of world's tag team they were tag team champions at one point these are two of the most creative minds in, in wrestling in Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy and uh yeah you, you have to recognize the influence that Matt Hardy had on these cinematic matches is WWE close to jumping the shark with them yes they are doing them a little too frequently for me personally, I, I think they need to be special and they're not making them feel special. Heck, we have another one this coming Friday on SmackDown for crying out loud. So um, they, they need to lighten it up with that uh, for sure. Yeah. And just to be clear on my previous point about Bruce Pritchard, I don't think that it's Pritchard writing the creative for Bray necessarily. I just think that because of his penchant for storytelling and his history as a producer, that 
he's using these cinematic matches and pushing them to the forefront as a way to progress storylines maybe a little bit better and in a little more a little bit more entertaining way but to rick's point i also think that they are very close to the line of already overexposing them uh, already i think matt really showed wwe that they could give a little bit more creative license to a wrestler and a character and that it would really get over with fans and can create a lot of buzz on social media and stuff like that and i think that's one of the things they're trying to do with how outlandish these matches are. And what really just disappoints me about that is I wish they would put this creative energy that they seem to have and these ideas and giving creative licenses, I wish they would actually give that to more wrestlers than just Bray Wyatt. I can't help but think, why are we watching SmackDown and seeing um, women being subjected to doing karaoke segments and uh, where it seems that they have no characters and no developments, yet Bray Wyatt's absolutely able to run wild with whatever is in his imagination and subject us all to it when they can't just do basic storylines um, for a lot of their talent. And, and Steph, just, just real quick to touch on, on something you said. Um, while, yes, I will agree with you that the karaoke segment for the women was absolute garbage, and even WWE recognized that at Extreme Rules when uh, Bray Wyatt did that little thing with the uh, Firefly Funhouse. Uh, I'll say this. The, the women's division as a whole is doing a lot better than the uh, men's division because there are so many goofy storylines and stipulations going on with the men right now. The women... It is very meat and potatoes. It is very basic. It is a bunch of kick-ass ladies who just want to go out and prove that they're the best and fight over championships, and that's really working for them right now. Um, although, yeah, I used the example of the women's karaoke segment that I used it because it's a particularly bad example of something that wrestlers were recently put through, but um, that's not me saying that the women's division isn't getting uh, as good or if not better uh, attention and and storylines in the men because the women are doing a lot better it's just i feel like every time we have a wrestler leave wwe whether it be the good brothers or luke harper they all have the same story of having these ideas that they try and pitch to vince and they just don't get listened to or he uses their idea for something else and it just really pains me then to see bray wyatt being the person that is seems to be allowed to do whatever he wants when other people seem to have great ideas that are just outright dismissed for some reason Bray is the only one who is allowed to have the freedom of expression. I'm going to leave it there because I do feel we would then be heading into a different topic which is no less worth discussing. Dude, I just spent two hours writing a Naomi piece because of that stupid segment. <laughs> yeah so at least if, if there's at least one good thing to take from it people are realizing that they're going to need to essentially take action themselves here and try and make these things happen. You, you do all raise good points Bray Wyatt has been essentially writing his own stuff. No one else gets that opportunity. I want to come to Corey now. Critical reception for the match has been mixed to say the least. What didn't work for you personally in the Swamp Fight? I think the biggest thing for me that didn't work, you know, really was just the presentation of is this a match or is this just a vignette? You know, yeah, some of the action was campy. Some of the fighting scenes, you know, with, with the extras was kind of campy and, and all that. But I give credit to the WWE for trying something different and trying something new, especially in this COVID-19 era. And so I was still very entertained by it. I thought it would have been an outstanding conclusion to an episode of SmackDown, you know, or maybe, uh, you know, one of the lead-in episodes into SummerSlam. You know, I, I would have seen it more in that vein as opposed to the main event of a pay-per-view. So for me, it wasn't necessarily one thing or the other or just, you know, the, the presentation uh, in and of itself. It's just the idea of that was the main event of a Extreme Rules pay-per-view. And I really just felt like it was just a very long vignette to progress the storyline to get us to the Fiend re-emerging, and that's really the match that we're all here to see, which is the Fiend and Braun Strowman. Yeah, I've been very vocal that, uh, you know, both on Twitter, on my radio show, and I'll, I'll say it right now, I, I, I loved pretty much everything about the Swamp Fight. It, it's very hard for me to pick anything that didn't, 
that didn't work um, because I, I looked at this match extremely differently. I, I didn't look at it as a match. I went into it thinking we were going to get something similar to what we got at, at WrestleMania. And if you go back to the Firefly Funhouse match, I mean, that was just one big, long piece of psychological warfare that, yeah, yeah, we don't know if that really took place in person. We don't know if that took place uh, in, in somebody's mind. Again, I look at Bray Wyatt as somebody who has mystical powers, so I just dispel all belief on this one and just and just dive right in. To me, the the only thing that I can sit here and say I have an issue with is how do you bring Braun Strowman back now to SmackDown? Like the last time we saw him. He literally drowned in a lake. So I, I'm not sure, you know, if we start off SmackDown with a 10 bell salute or what. Um, I, it just spitballing here. I'd say, you know, just dump, have somebody throw Braun Strowman out of a van, just covered in water and, and spitting up swamp muck. At like, you know, he has been basically kidnapped and gone for a week and, and just go from there. But that's, that's really my only question or issue is where do you go from here? Uh, because I look at these things completely differently. Well, I think for me, um, I've really made it clear how I feel with, with Bray doing these matches where these uh, psychological things happen, like two bronze and, uh, and Alexa Bliss appearing. Um, for me, if you cut out that, those two instances, I probably could grin and bear the match. I, I can't really think of any <laughs> of anything about it that actually worked for me. I just, you know, the Firefly Funhouse didn't work for me at all. Um, and I do, as someone that grew up as an Undertaker fan and that never had this problem with anything the Undertaker did, I feel like I can take a little bit of magic, I can take a little bit of mystical power, but what I can't take is something to the extent that we saw in the Firefly Funhouse match where we're left wondering, yeah, did this happen? Is this in Cena's head? What's going on? Um, and the same with the Swamp Fight. And don't forget that in WCW, the giant was literally shoved off the top of a building and fell what looked to be to his death and then came back later on in the night without a scratch on him and won the WCW championship. So on this Friday SmackDown, you're, you're talking about how do you bring Braun Strowman back? You absolutely bring him back, have him walking down the aisle, covered in water, covered in swamp mud, you know, spitting fish out of his mouth. I don't care, you know, but yes, you absolutely bring him back in that over the top way, because I think that with this storyline, you have to go over the top. And, and just like Rick said, I've been thoroughly enjoy, uh, entertained by this storyline. And I liked the swamp fight. Like I said, it wasn't a match, but it was a storyline progression, but I was still entertained. So yes, I hope that they definitely go over the top uh, when they bring Braun Strowman back from the swamp this Friday on SmackDown. I personally don't expect Braun to be emerging in SmackDown um, covered in swamp muck or anything like that. I think that Braun is probably going to just walk out and cut another promo on Bray and we're just going to move along the storyline and the exact events of the swamp match won't actually mean anything at all i think it's it will be interesting to see because obviously the firefly funhouse um seen it didn't come back so we didn't get to see how they moved on from that we didn't really get to see how they moved on from the boneyard match either but i don't as far as what they do in smackdown i don't really have any faith in them um turning braun now into some kind of swamp monster that went through this match at the weekend to be fair when it came to the boneyard match we did have aj styles literally turn up and say i got buried alive so what Alistair Black and Rey Mysterio were thrown off the roof of a building and they wrestled the next night. I do half expect, I, I did expect Rey Mysterio to just turn up on Raw. I really dispute that whole them being thrown off the roof thing because they showed so many aerial shots that it was clear to see that it wasn't the roof, you know, that there yeah. was a bit right below it. So when I was watching that match live, like I didn't think for a second that they'd been thrown off the roof. I thought they'd just been thrown onto a lower level that was just slightly inconvenient, but in no way life-threatening. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't help it that you could hear them landing on the big cushion as well. It also yeah. doesn't help that uh, uh, Baron Corbin wasn't arrested for murder immediately. So there's that part of it too. Yeah, the amount of times I've seen the police arrive to arrest someone, especially back in the Austin days, and Baron Corbin was just fine. I hate police and wrestling. 
just because I think like if that they should then be called like 90% of the time in the universe in my head that WWE exists in, I find that there shouldn't be police because in my head, these guys are basically signing some, sign of, some kind of contract to say that whatever happens, happens, like this is our job. So I'd say no police interference. And it's like when I was a child, I also thought they were under contract to only settle any kind of disputes on a Monday night. And that's why they didn't go to each other's homes just to attack them on a Wednesday. I mean, when you can put the custody of a child on the line in a ladder match, you're pretty much throwing all law enforcement policies out the window anyway, right? Yeah, that's, that's where you went? That's where you – we just had an eye for an eye match, man. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to wrap it up there, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us. For more from our guests, you can check out Stephanie Chase's YouTube channel, where she interviews big names such as Bailey, Carmella, and Corey Graves, and her personal favorite, Jay White. You can check out Ricky Chino's interview with Nikki Cross and his expert panel articles on Sports Kida, where he recently asked what should be next for the FTW Championship in AEW. And as with every week, you can hear Corey and myself on Sports Kida's weekly news podcast. I've been Tom Collihue, playing host for a change. Be sure to subscribe for more content like this. And thank you for joining us all today.